Kristen Silverberg is on, uh, is here with the next steps for the UK. Sorry about that. We sort of garbled that introduction to you, but we appreciate you coming <laughs> on. Let me ask you, what happens next? I mean, there is so much talk about the idea that now there are no trade agreements in place, that the UK basically has to hammer out new trade agreements with everybody or abide by the WTO rules, which are onerous in and of themselves. I mean, where do you go from here? Well, the first step is for the Conservative Party to elect a new leader sometime before the party conference in October. That person is likely to go to the parliament to ask for support invoking Article 50, which of course is the provision of the Lisbon Treaty that governs withdrawals from the European Union. And a majority of MPs support remaining in the European Union, so that could be a very interesting debate politically. That will kick off a two-year negotiation with the EU over the terms of the UK's withdrawal. And then at some point, point in that process, the UK will start negotiating with the EU over the terms of its new relationship. And so we won't even get to the question of what that relationship starts to look like for some time. They're gonna ha it, there'll be an extended period of uncertainty for the UK's economy and possibly for our own. So that, I mean, that is, that's what happens between the UK and the EU. But what about the UK and the rest of the world as they are now not part of the EU? Well, it depends in part on what relationship they negotiate with the EU. So one option is the Norwegian model, which gives them access to the, U to the EU's single market um, and lots of other things, but it requires their uh, agreement to open immigration um, from the EU. Alternatively, if they go with something like a free trade agreement with the EU, they would be forced to separately negotiate free trade agreements with everyone else. Um, with the U.S. possibly, with Canada, Australia, China, right. India, and so on. So in part, it depends on what, ar what arrangement they work out with the EU. And as I say, we're not going to even get to that negotiation for some time. You know, there, there are people around the world, whether they're in the U.K. or outside, who are going to say, oh, my goodness, this is a disaster. And there are others that are going to stand up and say, there's got to be a, a good opportunity in here. I heard KT McFarland say earlier today that this is a chance for the U.S. to step up and say, you know what? Let's form an even closer relationship. Let's really move together in this process. We want to be there for you. We want to make this easier for you and to really step in as opposed to, you know, before where, you know, President Obama stood at that news conference and said you're going to have to get in the back of the queue. Now that it's happened, isn't there an opportunity for America to forge a very powerful alliance with our most natural ally? I think we should do that, absolutely. I think it's very important, especially in light of the, um, of the financial services relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. I think it's really important we ensure that we have very um, close trade and investment relationship with them. But I think we have to be realistic about the costs we're paying as well. We are going to miss the U.K.'s voice in Brussels. There's no question about it on issues where um, we were relying on a kind of strong UK advocacy like the Iran sanctions, for example. We won't have, have the UK as an ally anymore. Um, on some regulatory and economic questions, they were among our most like-minded in terms of making Brussels uh, sort of more classically liberal, uh, more free market. And so I think we're going to have to be realistic about the fact that the debate in Brussels is going to be tougher on us without the UK there. Interesting point of view. Kristen Silverberg, thank you so much, Ambassador. We appreciate your time. David.